All right, welcome everyone. My name is Charles Anderson, representing the R Joy um, Restorative Justice for Oakland Youth, and it's day two of the 2022 Racism Under the Rainbow Conference. Um, it's been an exciting, inspiring time, and I'm excited to be the moderator for today's panel to recap all the greatness and the shares that we've experienced thus so far. Before we get started, I want to pass it to Dr. Andrew Jovalet to start off and do that. Start us in the grounding moment. Uh, good afternoon, relatives. I want to take a moment to acknowledge the Chochenyo Ohlone peoples and the other Ohlone people where the Queer Arts Center, uh, Healing Arts Center is located. Uh, I'd also like to acknowledge um, the other um, indigenous peoples in the territories where you all are viewing from today, um, as well as to acknowledge the labor of enslaved African and American Indian people whose labor helped to build uh, this country. So uh, may our ancestors be present with us uh, this afternoon as we talk. Thank you. Thank you. Um, let's go ahead and get started and see who's in the space with us today. So we have the, we just saw the amazing Dr. Andrew Jovalet. He's professor and department chair of ethnic studies at, as well as founding director of the Native American Indigenous Studies at UC San Diego. Prior to his work at UCESD, he was professor and department chair of American Indian Studies at San Francisco State University. Andrew is the author of nine books in print. Um, forthcoming including the Lanny, Lammy Award nominated Indian Blood, I, HIV and Colonial Trauma in San Francisco Two-Spirit Community. I'm excited for that one. Louisiana Creoles, uh, Cultural Recovery and Mixed Race Native American Identity, Louisiana Creole Peoplehood, Afro Ingenuity and Community, and Research Justice Methodologies for Social Change, among others. He's the board president of the Institute of Democratic Education and Culture. Uh, speak out in the American Indian Culture Center, San Francisco, and senior Ford Foundation fellow. Andrew is Louisiana Creole of, I need your help again, Atakapa Ishka? Ishak. Ishak. Oh, <laughs> okay. Okay, we'll say 85%. I think that's passing, right? Thank you. West African, uh, French, Spanish, Irish, and Italian descent. He's also co chair of the UC Ethnic Studies Council. Um, you're busy. So thank you for making time to join us today. Uh, we also have joining us Samson McCormick, um, who has been a dynamic comedic force of nature in the entertainment industry for over two decades. The award-winning queer comedy pioneer has appeared on BET, Viceland, Amazon Prime, TV One, and headline venues, including the Kennedy City Kennedy Center for Performing Arts, the Hollywood Improv, and in 2018 met history as the first LGBTQ comedian to perform at the Smithsonian Museum, African American History and Culture. Thank you for joining us today, Samson. Thank you for having me. We also have joining us today, Mike Wong, who uses his dual role as co-director of the Mathematics and Statistics Program at UC Berkeley Students Learning Center, and as the artistic director for the San Francisco Lesbian Gay Freedom Band March and Prep Program to bring his message of service and social justice to many different audiences. Mike depends, Mike spends his days empowering students to make meaningful, meet that, ah, sorry, coffee hasn't kicked in yet. Mike spends his days empowering students to make meaning of mathematics for themselves and training other educators in leveraging mathematics education as social justice. Mike spends his evenings and weekends using music to promote LGBTQ plus visibility to all audiences, empowering community members to cultivate their own musicianship and ultimately use music as a way to unite diverse communities. Thank you for joining us today. Happy to be here. Um, last but certainly not least, we have Ken Folks, loud by Huffington Post, selected as 2018's SF Pride Grand Marshal and co feature in the 2020 GLAD award winning documentary State of Pride. Ken Folt is a celebrated educator, human rights activist, author, and community organizer. As a co founder of the East Bay's very first TGNC led LGBTQIA Healing Arts Center digital archive and gallery. Ken is a col and the collaborative of Oakland, California-based QTPIPOC plus 
ally interdisciplinary artists and health practitioners offer the global community creative opportunities for holistic wellness through cultural competent accessible workshops into interdisciplinary art programs innovative community building events and human rights advocacy this includes the queer art center coding and graphic design tech boot camp for marginalized lgbtqia plus beings and their art in actions including the Bay Area's longest street mural seen around the globe that proudly proclaims all Black trans, queer, non-binary non women, disabled, and prison lives matter. Thank you for putting all this together, Kim folks, oh, and all that you, you do in this community. Thank you, honey. I'm so happy that you are introducing everybody. You've done a fabulous job. That was a lot of words and a lot of I, You know, and I'm going to be fully transparent. I didn't finish all my uh, hooked on fondness as a kid, so I'm also proud of myself. So thank you. I'm all proud of you. Okay. It's a lot for anybody. W X Y Z. you. Um, we also had, uh, and correct me, is it Ms. Janetta Johnson earlier, but she's taking the time to rest and recover. I have all support with Radical Rest, but we just want to make sure her name was mentioned as a contributor to this year's conference. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm curious, everyone. Um, I know we talked about racism, all that comes with being, you know, being in this world. But what is the song or music right now that's bringing you the most joy? We'll start off light and gentle. And whoever likes to go first. Any house music, gospel house primarily. Really? Yes, yes, yes. Anything that um, DJ David Harness plays is it's gonna be it's gonna be everything that I need in that moment. I love it. We might have to create a, a post conference playlist off of oh, that. Oh, let's get the playlist. Spotify. Uh, who's next? Who would like to share? Um, I think the song that brings me the most joy right now is um, Back That Ass Up by uh, Pastor Shirley Caesar. No, I'm just playing. <laughs> Let me find out she has an underground uh, remix. <laughs> I support well, I it, though. I'll see sure that. That's, that's the remix. <laughs> so, um, All praise and I, worship I, matters. I'm telling you that right there. <laughs> no, I actually, uh, I actually do listen to uh, Tupac a lot. You know, I listen to a lot of that because it, it has that umph that I need to get through a lot of days. Um, but a song that is really standing out to me in particular um, is is a is an actual gospel song uh, called Lily in the Valley by John P. Key. And it speaks of maintaining the strength to get through any moments that that you may experience while, you know, traveling through life. And um, and I think a lot of us need that reminder. So that's mine right now. I love it. I love it. Such a great question. Charles, such a great. Andrew, Mike. I'll go ahead. Um, you know, authentic, authentic answer. I literally was a couple minutes late to our, our meeting here because I was, I was going through things and then something came up on my Facebook that was, I just couldn't put it down. I had the smile on her face. And it's so interesting because it's the confluence of the earlier, our, the session we had yesterday on Asian American perspectives on allyship and Blackness because it took Pachelbel's canon you know, very white, straight kind of sound. But it was being played by a Japanese artist, Hiromi Urahara, who each level, just on piano, all by herself, made it, brought in jazz, brought in different themes, and the joy on her face, just smiling and laughing the whole time while she was doing it. And jazz, such a, a comes from, you know, African music, like the true African-American music there. And I just thought, wow, this is actually, you took this boring, white piece of music and then put the Asian and black influence spin on it 
with such wonderful joy. And so it was just literally, I couldn't put it down. And it's like, oh, I'm late. I got to go. So <laughs> that's actually so funny that you're asking this question right now. I love it. I love it. That's a diversity initiative I can support. Yes. Um. Please throw that on the playlist. <laughs> Mine is also a gospel song. I had I looked it up because I hadn't heard it. I, someone shared it with me yesterday privately, and there was a young man singing it, Better Days by Leandria Johnson. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't heard it. Um, and so I heard her version as well. The little boy can sing. It's really amazing. So it just it was, it was very uplifting. Um, so, yeah. So I appreciate, um, well, one, thank you all for sharing. It's interesting. I listen to gospel music. <clears throat> even on my relationship with churches in question right now, but definitely uh, while I'm at work, especially the whole return to office thing, I put my headphones in as being the chocolate place on my whole floor. I put my gospel music just to keep my spirit up. So I feel like if it worked for my ancestors, you know, it could work for me to, uh, in this time period. But the song that I thought of um, is actually Aretha Franklin. I didn't, I just recently learned this. She has an album that was produced by uh, with Luther Vandross, and it's called Love Me Right. Um, so I was listening to that before we got started. Um, and I think that kind of ties into one of our sessions yesterday. Um, and I'm going to start with this question, just opening it out. Uh, we talked about uh, kinship, like how do we look and support each other as family? And that inspired the question, from all your experience and perspective, what are the ways to you know, embody that with others who may not have this, you know, same life experience as you. Um, I can start, you know, it's interesting. Um, I'm gonna say something probably I maybe <laughs> usually don't, but as I think about it and we've been reflecting the last, uh, I don't know, a couple of weeks in particular, just like a lot of difficult things have been happening and <clears throat> people's personalities and drama. Part of kinship is also, because I did the session around kinship yesterday. And so normally it's like, oh, how do we, you know, be there for people? And we have to be there for ourselves, I think, too, right? But and part of being there for ourselves so we can be there for other people means cutting people out who aren't our kin. And so I think right now, I think when you asked the question, it struck me. I was like, you know what? There's something, there's another part of this that didn't really get said yesterday, I think. And that's some people aren't meant to be in our life um they don't serve a positive person or as my mom used to say she told me some people come into your life for a season some for a lifetime know the difference and so i think sometimes i'll speak for myself i think i can we can i can spend too much time trying to get along with people that don't want to get along or care for people who don't want to maybe or don't know how i should say be cared for um so i think that, that that's part of it and then the other piece is is showing up. I think it is caring for people and showing up. And sometimes it is showing up and caring even when maybe someone else does it because people have difficult times. I think it's knowing the difference of when that threshold of it's bringing you down maybe, right? Or um, is not helpful, right? When I used to go to therapy, the therapist, she asked me this and I thought it was, I was like, oh, sounds so simple. She said, how does it serve you? And so I would always, I would ask myself, like, whether it was like, oh, you're smoking or you're drinking or you're whatever it is you're doing that you're not supposed to be doing, right? Being queer is something, right? Historically, you're not supposed to be, right? Um, all these things. So then it's like, well, how does this serve me, right? And I think kinship is also at a certain point, like, does this relationship, is it sustaining? Is it nurturing? Um but also, is it mutual? I guess that's part of the question you're asking too, is, is, is because people ask that sometimes when we talk about kinship, it's like, well, what about people who don't stand in the same, stand for the same things or don't support the same things or you're constantly showing up and those people aren't showing up as well. I think that's when we have to actually step, take, step away and step back and protect and guard that energy for, you know, other things, more precious things. I love it. Uh, anyone else want to add on? Um, so mine's is two ways. Um, and, and it's interesting how as you develop more life experience, you, you see your blind spots. And so one of mine is seeing um, more how I relate to people based on what this is. This is how can I say this? Mine's is more. 
my relationships with people have gotten better when I have allowed, when I have learned to allow people to be them and mm-hmm. not my perception of what I think they should be. And I, I was raised that way to, to be an idea as opposed to an individual. And so up until a couple of years ago, I actually found that I was doing that with folks. Like I, I would be disappointed if they weren't behaving the way I thought they should behave as opposed to appreciate them for who they are. Um, so that, that's that been a big one and it's definitely made my relationships a lot richer and a lot better. Um, and the other one is simply learning to listen and understand how to relate to people better. You know, most of the time, if you truly listen to folks, they will tell you who they are. And, you know, like Andrew said, you'll know whether you need to be dealing with them or not. (laughs) And if it's somebody that you do need to be dealing with, you learn how to show up for them better. Thank you. Ken, I feel like you were ready to say something. I was, I'm just piggybacking off of what both Andrew and Samson have said. You know, there's a, there's a part of us, especially as queer, trans, black, brown folks that feeds into some stereotypes that we've been raised with, even within our own communities, because we are living in a society that has so much power to affect imagery. And what you were saying, Samson, I'm finding is true for me too. I've become the thing that I was raised to be to support a structure in this society that I don't want to be a part of anymore. You know, and like taking the time to look at your friendships, your kinships, allows you to to assess that differently when you've taken the time to like hone in on what is truly valuable, what you want to keep in yourself, forgetting about like the other people around you, but like what is valuable to you? Who have you been for the past few decades? Um, And sourcing through that is important before even getting into these other uh, assessments with others. Because I find that once I take the time to look at like, dang, I'm a giver. I'm a giver. Maybe I'm an (laughs) overgiver. You know, like they're oversharers. Maybe I give too damn much. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, and it's a hard thing to acknowledge because in these bodies, with our empathic brains, we're so used to cutting off our limbs and saying, can you take more? Who wants more? And now I'm realizing that hasn't actually been a healthy way to live. It's been the way to navigate some of these spaces in these bodies with these spirits that it hasn't necessarily been healthy. So yeah, just doubling down on sitting down alone sometimes and having a deep conversation, what you would call a come to Jesus moment, Samson, (laughs) with yourself. That's the kinship I'm trying to hold on right now. That's what I'm into. So thank you. It's a great question. Well, that leads me to my next question. So I know in that same presentation. uh, Oh, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 you know, it was interesting because I went in the exact same place. The answer for me was the first piece is being consistent with yourself. Like you really need to know who you are, what's important to you. That's the thing you can control. That's the thing you need to understand. I feel like every time Ken and I, we've had our long conversations, I can be my authentic self. And I also am finding my authentic self and refining as we both do in the back and forth. And I think what uh, Samson and Andrew you bring up is, so if I can do that, then the true kinship that I feel with the most closest to me they start showing their real selves and then you can be, okay, this is someone who I really am authentically connecting with. Then there's kind of this middle tier where there are parts of you that are unformed or need some d- evolution, but um, I can be there because I'm consistent with myself. I can, I can work with you. I can talk things through. I mean, if there's someone who's completely, you know, they always say, if someone's telling you who they are, their true selves, believe them. Right. And sometimes it's like, okay, I'm believing you and what you're saying. And you're now someone who I just can't, you, 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 you take the energy away from me. But then there's also, where are you in that moment too? Like sometimes I can give more sometimes. Okay. I'm going to bridge that gap, even though it's hard, I'm going to try and find the common ground, even though it's hard. And then other times it's like, no, you, you are not for me right now. 
you are taking me down. You are, I'm, I'm not in a place where I can deal with that. So it's also knowing where you are in that moment. And I'm, are you going to be able to bridge that gap or is it not the right thing to do at that time? So that's kind of where I fit. Thank you for the question. I love it. Um, as Samson was talking, it reminded me uh, how Andrew shared the platinum rule yesterday. Um, I love that I wrote it down. I tweeted about it, all of that. And with the platinum room versus the golden room is treat people that they want to be treated. And my question to you, I was like, how, how suggestions are, how do we do that and still honor ourselves? May I take that one? Of course. <laughs> I'm autistic. <clears throat> I didn't start speaking until I was almost five years old. I mean, like nothing, didn't say anything. I was learning how to read because my mom and my dad, you know, they were just amazing beings and they would read to me all the time. So even though they were being told by society that I, I was someone who couldn't learn and grow, they, they never accepted that. So I thank them for allowing me the possibility to even be. With that being said, I feel like I'm always a step behind in terms of understanding and assessing the true intentions of others, right? And part of that is a beautiful thing. It allows you to be very open, open-hearted, open-spirited. And at the same time, it can waste a lot of time at the very least. It can waste a lot of time and energy. So I'm finding that learning how to assess a situation for integrity for true intentions is about hanging out with some old people. <laughs> Just like, I've been rolling with elders and they will pull me aside in a hot second and just say, you know, you're giving a little bit too much or this person is asking all the time and it's only going to you. Um, people do, I'm, I'm fortunate or unfortunate as the case may be, people feel very comfortable telling me exactly what their needs are. And it's important to be able to have some folks who can pull you back and remind you that people can feed themselves too. There are a lot of folks that can do for themselves. And when we start talking about love languages, we have a, a class that we teach at the center. I had a problem with love languages, okay? In one of my relationships, they were like, oh man, my love language is gifts. And I was like, you should get those for yourself. <laughs> you know, like, I love that you love gifts. Gift on, do that. There was this expectation that it would be transactional, right? Like I do for you, you gotta do for me. So what, what you're saying, Andrew, what I love is that it's less about, you know, this keeping track of who's done for whom and how often. And it's really about creating a dynamic of care. Like, okay, I'm, I care for you. And because I care for you, I'll listen. And the, I hope that the people around me will let me know when it's starting to become unhealthy. So that's that. It's so funny you brought up, thank you, Ken. The, <clears throat> I was thinking of the love languages too. And I, I think the question, I mean, I think they're not incompatible. I think that's the first thing we have to say, right? What we want and need, right? Is not incompatible with treating other people the way they wanna be treated. I think that's where this country, white supremacy, right? Makes it some big, that's the big mistake, right? That, you know, uh, it's me, 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 right? But then there's no we in that. I think we come a lot of times from a place of being, everybody's talking about being givers and doing and doing and doing. You can think of yourself and not in a way of necessarily, it's not to be selfish, right? I think we have to use our own words. I think sometimes you're like, it's okay to be selfish. No, that's radical care, radical love for ourselves, right? Um, and so I think the thing where it becomes dangerous is if the other person, they have a love language. You're always attuned to it. You have yours and they, and they ain't, they ain't even attuned to yours, right? They ain't worried about yours, right? So I think that's where it goes back to the first question and kind of, I think what Samson was saying, you know, that you have to accept people where they are, believe them. I've been very, very guilty of the sometimes if people tell you the first time you need to believe them. I'm like, oh no, try again, try again. Oh hell, why'd you do that again? That's on me then, right? Um, if they told you and, you know, you let them in or you, you know, say yes to another thing that you probably really shouldn't be saying yes to or to do, that becomes on us. And so I think it's really, it's, 
it's a balance. I think a lot of it is about a balance of pausing, not trying not to overthink. Sometimes I, I again, speaking for myself, I will overthink um, situations and, and, and people and always want to, I, I do start from a place of believing the best. Um, so actually I think, um, you know, for example, when Mike was talking, I was thinking about, I actually pretty open with anybody. You could be a, str- you could be a stranger, excuse me, the dog in the back. You know, it could be a um, stranger. And I, it's like, why are you sharing so much, right? But I think that that is about, that's just who I am, I think. And then then later people show if, if they can accept or hold who you are, right? But sometimes we're all like, uh, say you're on that, your first dating or whatever, and people don't want to say too much about themselves. I'm like, I'm going to tell you so you know, if you know what you're getting into, other, you know, might as well, but I'm too old for that anyway, right? I'm not waiting, you know, for the whole, let's get to know each other slowly. I mean, either you can take all of it or you can't, right? So I think there's something about that. Then you also find out later, oh, that this wasn't really, <laughs> I remember so, <laughs> it's like someone I dated, this was superficial though, but I was like, oh, this was that back at, um, uh, bench and bar, but way back in the like late nineties at bench and bar. And I did date the person. Um, and I don't think they'll watch and it, it's, it's okay if they do, but it's like, it was a very superficial thing, but they had their hat on, had these beautiful eyes. I'm like, Oh, wow. It was like the next day it reminded me of this episode of the fresh Prince of Bel-Air where Will was hanging out with a girl and all her stuff comes off. Right. I was like, his eyes were fake. They were contacts. He took his hat off. Nothing wrong being bald, you know, but I was like, Oh, you trying to hide all this stuff? It was because his head was pointed to or whatever, you know. Awesome person. I'm just saying, as a metaphor, it's like what we conceal shows up later, right? And so I think part of this question too about the platinum rule is about being vulnerable. That's what radical love is: is being vulnerable and showing up as our full, authentic self. Not that we were talking about intersectionality yesterday, and I was saying that's also problematic to yeah. me now because it's so limited. So anyway, yeah. May I jump on this for a second? Because you said <laughs> something, I'm going to make it really, really quick. Um, the love languages. Um, the problem that I have with the love language and the way that it was written in this transactional way is that it makes an assumption. It didn't even make the assumption. It's not even discussed. How do we assess our own love language? How do we actually understand that we should be in a conversation with ourselves around love? you know, rather than expecting or hoping that somebody else will fulfill that. It's really important to do that work. Oftentimes that work might include a therapist. You know, it might mean going back and trying to figure out some stuff that you you truly needed when you were much younger. And when you have someone who's very quickly in that moment of like, hey, let's exchange. It isn't always the case that someone's done that work. And so it's, it's really about everyone giving themselves the permission to love themselves enough to figure out how they communicate their love language to themselves. That's all of it. And, and I, it's right on point with what you're saying. I'll share, I'll share. Uh, my next question is actually for Mike. Uh, one of the things I really appreciate is the way you were able to weave the different like, forms of media. So you had the audio clips, you had the vi- you know, pictures, um all the things to help like really um present the topic so i'm curious like from your experience you're artistic director of the band you also working with math which i think is a beautiful you know um collaboration so like how do you like what advice do you have in like how to use art or media in regards to like having those challenging conversations and topics Oh, I think where I, I go to first is authenticity, of course. I mean, like, what, what, is, what is the truth to more myself? And so using all of those things, I thought that what would be more authentic than showing the faces of the people and having those stories being brought? And sometimes it's music, sometimes it's video, sometimes it's spoken word. But however, mediums allow them to authentically show what they, they, who they are, who they were also, because many of the people we were looking at were people who were murdered and um, I wanted to make sure their stories were told. I intentionally 
did not name any of the perpetrators of the violence. Mm. I don't know if you noticed that, but that was an intentional design because the people who we want to remember, say her name, say his name, having their faces seen, those were the things I focused on because visually and orally, you want those things to be the things that stick out. So, so for me, um, it's about stories and it's making sure the stories are heard and those stories can be told as you said, and so many, uh, so articulately better than I am, um, that can be told visually, show orally, show musically. And um, sometimes it's bringing, in the conversation we had in the prep work, Andrew brought up um, Sam Cooke, and it was just even just bringing the story of the music to people who might never have thought to, to even think, what's the story behind this piece of music? I just like the tune. And that can be a way to have that authentic story come up. And so unpacking where that came from. So, so it's, it's, it's about authenticity. And sometimes that sells itself. It tells you, okay, this is the, the medium and the venue that will tell that story the best. Thank you. Thank you. Same question for you, Ken. Like you, all the array of things that, you know, all the wonderful work is happening in the center. Like, how do you navigate that? Like using art in, your creativity to like showcase these topics and hard, have these hard, hard conversations. Hmm. Um, may I actually pass that question on to Samson? Because I, I believe that it's um, Paul Mooney, Samson McCormick, Moms Mabley. A lot of the people who have given me some direction actually around how to laugh at myself, how to, uh, because to navigate creativity, especially in a world that is built on capitalism, the world that we are living in right now and this side of the planet, you really have to have um, a grounding that allows you to step outside of the nonsense. And so I, I just watch the way that Samson navigates really difficult conversations, the way that Samson has pulled from various ways that he is creative, whether it's film, whether it's comedy, whether it's sitting and writing, actually your writing is spectacular. Um, so yeah, and, and he can dance. I've seen you in the club. <laughs> so um, if you don't mind, I'd like to defer that. Thank you, Ken. So for me, and this is just my approach, um, I think that it is very important for us to share and encourage other folks to find, like Ken said, that thing that keeps you grounded. Uh, earlier this morning, I was having a conversation with a friend and I was saying that comedy has been the one thing that I've had that has encouraged me to continue to grow and be a better person. Um, I had to sit with myself, especially during the pandemic, when I wasn't able to get on the stage and I didn't have an outlet. And so I realized that comedy truly has been an outlet for me to release a lot of anger. Um, I'm not gonna get into details on all that. <laughs> you gotta get into but, it a little bit, honey. Just, just a little bit. I'm, I, will, I will later. Okay, okay. Um, well, okay, so just to share a little bit, um, I think about, for instance, things that I did not get in my childhood. I also think about um, how not getting some of those things delayed me being able to um, process different parts of the experiences that I would have as both a Black man and as a Black gay man. You know, so a lot of that understanding I didn't develop until later. That included being in relationships that were horrible for me. That included, like, I think a couple of us are on this call being an overgiver sometimes. And, you know, I, I go into some situations, you know, I, I, am, I am learning how to live without the trust issues that I had that you develop when your parents are enemy number one, <laughs> you know, but having that reality or, or coming from that reality and not be a horrible person because I was determined not to be a horrible person. Even though I didn't know that's what I was doing, the ability to laugh at 
the things that I was going through gave me a certain strength that I don't think I would have had um, had I not had comedy, you know? And this is not to shame anybody else, but some people have some very unhealthy vices and habits you know, to, um, to deal with their issues. And so thankfully mine was laughter. And I find that in engaging people in really important conversations and being able to laugh, you know, while we have those conversations, it also encourages them to be open, honest, vulnerable, and, um, and even approach their life in different ways and their understanding of, of other people in a lot of different ways. So it's, for me, it's been, it's been life-saving, to oh, say the okay. least. Actually, my last question is for you, Samson, actually. So, perfect pivot. Um, so, you're a comedian. Your profession is to help bring joy and laughter to others. I'm curious, what are the ways you do that for yourself? Um, watch white people do stupid stuff. You know, I'm just playing. <laughs> <laughs> And you know, and TikTok is good for that. So yes. <laughs> it's, you know, you can just get on Twitter and scroll and be like, really? These people are nuts. No, I'm just playing. Um, <laughs> but there's really no you. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm not. I'm not. But <laughs> be like, you season your food with what? Nothing? Okay, no, I'm just playing. Um, or you don't. Honestly, hear- The way that I do it is just by learning to accept life for what it is. And um, if you allow it to be, life can be hard. And I think that, um, again, being able to or season what season the chicken after is that you talking about Paula Patton? I'm going to leave that alone. We all on different journeys. Uh, that's all it's a whole journey. different. That's a whole different set of circumstances. Um, no, but hold on. What was the question again? Because now I didn't got. How do you that. how do you cultivate joy for yourself? <laughs> yes, by by accepting. There's actually it's it's funny. It's it's comedy for me is not just about laughing. It also comes from my faith and not in a particular religion, but my faith that I can get to the next moment that I can get to in life, that I will be okay, that the people I need to show up for me when, I, when I'm trying to do something will show up, that the people who are my family, like Ken, you know, like Andrew, even though we don't chat that often, but we, you know, online might like something or something like that. Or, or some a couple of my other friends that they they're there you know we're all living our own lives but if somebody needs something or needs to talk we're there you know um so that faith fuels the comedy um education fuels it and i think it really is learning to um have fun with what is and for me, that's that's what comedy does. It's it's looking at life with this pair of glasses on that a lot of really uptight people need to put on. And it allows you to be more optimistic about life. It allows you to um, want to grow and want to get better. And, and um, overall, just think and approach life in a very positive way. And I think in particular for us as both Black people and queer people, people of color, women, disabled folks, um, you know, anyone else who who doesn't really get to speak out in a way where people hear them, um, we need that. And so that's how I use comedy. I love it. I love it. Thank you. All right. To close this out, this is open to everyone. Um, you know, I think most of the workshops were yesterday. Is there any like additional um, topics or discussion people like to bring up that they felt like wasn't fully discussed yesterday or in the previous presentations? Of course. (laughs) Thank you. Um, We we talked about perception and we we brought this up in your session, Mike. Um, We talked about um, expectation and how we have to start to tear down what we've been told we should believe about the other, whoever the other is. And, you know, Andrew, 
you really solidified or crystallized for me this notion of family, right? And how family truly shows up through their actions. Mm. Um, so I was, I was thinking about both of these and you can't really tell a lot about a person, at least for me, I have to spend time with people. That's a really important thing that I didn't get a chance to say yesterday. And it's that as people who are marginalized, oftentimes what we want is for people to just take a moment, just take a moment and get to know us. You know, um, this notion of walking in somebody else's shoes. It's such a, a fast paced world and people very quickly want to determine who you are so that they can determine your value in a, in a society that decides that we are commodities. And so if we really want to upend um, inequality and we want to put more equity into our lives, I think it really starts with just saying to people, you got to really get to know me. You got to spend time, even if it's that we just go to this one thing a year, like we're in this space together, or um, it could be going to the, to the lake to something that's being held that's just outdoor and, and free. We need to create more community spaces where people can actually show up. And it also needs to be online, not just physical um, IRL, but more spaces where there's accessibility for all of us. So that's what I wanted to say yesterday. I didn't get a chance to say today. And I'm so grateful for everyone being in this conversation. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, just to piggyback off of Ken, I think that, um, you know, true authentic friendship and true authentic family are important because we live in a time now where, uh, you know, somebody will say, oh, well, what is your name on Instagram? You know, either they'll look you up, they want to see who follows you, they see who who you follow, see what you've been doing. And I think that, again, it's it's people base their friendships and, and kinships on the wrong things. And, you know, <laughs> that's the reason why, even though I got all my stuff on Instagram, I, I play with people. You know, when we hang out, I give them bad weed. I take them to horrible places. Um, you know, <laughs> I tell them, <laughs> you all your business to that level. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you got to make sure that, that the people are, and if they, and if you do all that, if you take them to, you know, some place that's not awful, but you know, you don't you don't give people your very best right away. You know, um, it takes a lot of energy for me to show up for people. I like being here. I like being in my head. And so for me to step out of that and to, to have an experience with someone else, that's very valuable to me. And um, I don't give people all of that. Like I make sure they're able to step into whatever they need to step into to show up for me in an authentic way without anything, you know, before I come doing the same thing. And so, you know, when you, when you give people, I don't want to say the bare minimum, but when you give them some bad weed and sit in the car with cockroaches, you know, <laughs> outside of a, outside of a trap house somewhere, and they still call you back and go, I understand you. We're going to have a great friendship. You keep those people around. But, you know, of course, if you are introducing people, all your best friends and all these great experiences and, and they know that they can benefit in a certain type of way, of course, those people are going to be there. And, and again, like we've said, like Andrew said, like Kid has said, you know, I think that is, it is very important to know what your limits are in giving and in how to show up for people. And, and there's this word that a lot of us learn later in life called boundaries. You know, when somebody, you already done gave two of your fingers, now they want your whole hand being able to tell them no. Slap them like y'all at the Oscars. Okay, I'm gonna leave it alone. <laughs> so funny, so I um, I was just gonna add, add, add real quick. I was just gonna say it's like they're soul suckers, right? I mean, I think at a certain point, our sappers, right? People who just take all your energy, and then you lose your own self, and that causes soul wounds. That's why people. And how do we heal those soul wounds, right? And so it's like something's been pulled out of you, um, you know. And I was thinking when you were talking about we were the part on comedy earlier too is. My dad always said, don't let anybody steal your joy, 
But the other part of it, he used to tell me he'd be at work and people would be like, why are you always smiling? Why are you so happy? He said, why aren't you? You know, this thing of people living and not um, to, to not under, to, to, to be so used to negative energy, right? So I think a lot of times too, all it, it, well, who we surround ourselves with, we want people that are also bringing joy to our life. I mean, I think we really need people who are joyful, like how we started. We talked like, what, what song makes you happy right now? What people make us happy right now? What people bring us joy right now? And maybe that, not maybe, that's a question we should be asking every day. I, I know I ask, um, you know, and I'm thankful for those people who maybe I know very well and some I don't even know. Kindness of strangers actually reaching out for who knows what sometimes. I mean, so I think that that kind of those jo that joy force, the people who are the joy forces in our life show up in, in many different ways. Why did you have something to add to the topic? I just, I like that word, joy forces. We got to remember that. I was thinking how we have limited resources and that's energy, time, money. And we need to spend our, our, our time, especially like time in this kind of space, um, meaningfully because, um, gosh, you know, I mean, I'm now in a place in my life where I'm seeing people dying. I'm seeing people's families dying as a grief. That's why one of the things I brought in was shared grief as a way to connect. And so for me, I think that where I wanna go in the next iteration would be to, well, let's use what time we have on this earth, what energy we have on this earth in ways that can move us forward and can make the world better where we didn't have enough time was to really talk about what were things that we could do? What are solutions? What are ways that we can bridge, build bridges between Asian and black communities? Um, we unpacked some of the reasons why it doesn't actually happen for everyone. Um, we've, we found some people who are bridging that gap. How do we bring that to more people? But then there's the other side. Like at, at some point you try to spend all this energy building bridges and if they just don't want to cross the bridge, they just want to cross the bridge. And then you have to spend that energy. All right, I'm going to resolve my, my purpose. I'm going to be true to myself. I'm going to fight the battle still. You're either with me or against me. And so there's that too. And so do you waste your energy on someone who's just not going to change or not going to listen to you? Or do you just build your reserves, make your arguments stronger? One of the things we teach in, the, in teaching and learning is active listening. And you, one of the pieces of active listening is listening to be influenced. Mm. But that does, it not, that does not mean you're going to be persuaded necessarily by the argument. Like if they're wrong, they're wrong. But you listen to that argument and then you think, well, wait, let me strengthen mine based on what I'm hearing. Otherwise, you just get this echo chamber. And, but you might also be influenced because you know what? There's a, there's a truth there that maybe I'm not accounting for. You're still wrong for, for lots of other things. But there might be, I'm seeing your perspective a little bit, so let me see how I can take this authentic perspective you're showing me that might bring you to wrong conclusions and find, a, find that common ground and be able to say, okay, well, but here's where it lives in my reality. But then, of course, it goes back to my original statement, consistency, authenticity with myself. You have your values, you have your beliefs, your core things that make you who you are. Those are non-negotiable. So I think... That's where it goes. So that's where I want to go. I want to go. The next step is let's let's have those discussions, those solutions. Let's cross talk. Let's 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 see where that common ground can be, so we can make this world a better place. And let's also find out that's not where the energy is worth it. That that would be, you know, you'd get so little from spending your investing your energy in that. And so let's find out what are the things that we can actually spend the energy on that can make the biggest difference. I love it. That's the perfect benediction. I appreciate you. Um, well, once again, it's been an honor and pleasure to be sharing this virtual space with you all. I look forward to the next conference. I'm thinking, can we go ahead and just close out um, for those who may be listening or watching, who'd be interested in contacting you offline, if you can share how to reach out to you, and then we'll have Kim folks go ahead and, you know, close us out. So I, you're saying that we each should go around, correct? 
if you feel whoever yeah. feels comfortable. If you feel you know, comfortable. Yes. Awesome. Awesome. But I know we also talked about putting the boundary. So I said whoever That's feels right. comfortable sharing. That's right. Oh my gosh. <laughs> my cell phone, my cell phone number is just <laughs> my Google number is <laughs> Samson's like my only fans. <laughs> oh well, it's Christian Mingle now. No, I'm just <laughs> Oh, that's no, in a prayer uh, circle? <laughs> uh, yeah, throw it in a prayer, in a prayer circle. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Instagram. You know, I'm on Instagram at Samson McCormick and uh, Amazon Prime. We have, uh, I'm producing some great Black queer film. Really? Um, that, that our community can be very proud of. And um, yeah, YouTube, Google. I'm out there and just, you know, if you're looking for something that is, that will make you feel good while you're looking at it and you want good comedy, just follow my stuff. And, um, and I'm also in the community. Community is very important. to me. Thank you. Well, Andrew, we know where you work, so we know how to find you too. <laughs> yeah. Right. Just, exactly. Just, right. just do a Google search. That's right. And Mike too. Well, except if you do Mike Wong, there's a billion of us. So the key is actually um, Andrew and my common thread. If you do the Michael James Wong, that's where you find me. The James is kind of important because otherwise you get all the other Michael Wongs. And it's either through the San Francisco Lesbian Gay Freedom Band, Mike Wong, at sflgfb.org, if that, that would be the best email for me. Or you can find me at UC Berkeley Student Learning Center. Thank you. And Charles, where can we find you, honey? I don't want to be found, but thank you. <laughs> I find myself. Okay, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, you can find me on most social media. I apologize and don't apologize for if you find me on Twitter. Um, that's my favorite safe place now. But it's at Chicarlo, uh, C H A R L O. Um, Charles and Carlos put together. Um, but yeah, feel free to reach out and let's talk. <laughs> You also can find me at Our Joy here in Oakland, or at the, or at the Queer Media Arts Center. <laughs> that's right. That's right. That's right. You know, we have an advisory board of community members, and um, Charles is on our advisory board, and hopefully, everyone else in the space will be on the advisory board. It's really important to be able to grow, and to um, have people who can compassionately, lovingly guide you to growth. And so I really appreciate this conversation. Um, we'll continue to do the work. And I, I think for me, I need to shift that language though, because for people in bodies like ours that for centuries were perceived as machine, I think I need to switch that up. So I'm gonna say that we're gonna get together and have another conversation, a series of amazing sessions where we're growing and we're learning together and we're laughing together. And I look forward to that. So um, stay tuned, pay attention to what's happening on the Queer Arts Center web uh, site. It's queerartcenter.com. Um, I wanna send a special shout out to one of my godsons who is celebrating his birthday today, their birthday. Also, um, he is the pronoun mo most often that they use. Isol, we love you. We love you, love you, love you. Happy solar return. I want to thank the Howard University um, Spring Break, its alternative spring break interns who came and helped do some research and preparation for this conference. They are fabulous. I love every single one of you. We're putting all of this information on the website. Make sure you go and familiarize yourself with the work that's being done at Howard, Howard University. Um, you already know is one of the institutions, establishments here that really is pushing for equity for everybody. So it was an honor to work with Howard University and with all of you. So I, I hate that we have to wrap it up. I do, I do. I wanna to continue to have this conversation. So maybe we can um, plan something in between the next session, which won't be for another three months where we can talk about things like compersion. A lot of people don't even know what the heck compersion is. Compersion is the opposite of jealousy. It's the, it's the only word that actually is the opposite of jealousy in the English language. 
And there are a lot of words that are used in the dictionary that harm us. And this is one of those words that could support us moving forward as, as people. So maybe we'll talk about that sometime. I see that Samson's on the move. <laughs> Thank you very much, everybody. Stay well. Morning. Take care. Thank you all. Peace. Hi.